Welcome to Christ Church. We're glad for your presence here on this second Sunday of Advent. Go to ChristChurchNYC.online where you can find a connection card where you can tell us a little more about yourself. There, you will also find weekly events like daily prayer, midweek meditation, and the Sunday live stream. In particular, pay attention to our Advent and Christmas programming, including the Christmas concert on Friday, December 16th at 7.30, our children's celebration and feast on December 18th after the 11 a.m. service, and our Christmas Eve services on December 24th. Go to ChristChurchNYC.online forward slash events for the full list of Advent activities. Now let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Advent is our season of preparation for the wondrous new thing God has in store for us, the constantly renewing hope of God's graceful intrusion in the life of the world. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Out in the desert, John the Baptist calls the people to prepare themselves for the arrival of God's Messiah. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of your repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. While watching a news show this week, an advertisement for General Motors electric cars washed in, featuring a soundtrack of Bob Dylan's famous rock hymn, The Times They Are A-Changin'. And honestly, though I've grown accustomed to how capitalism exploits and often debases the best of what our culture produces and servitude to the almighty dollar. I was a bit sad this song had been exploited for selling cars. Not a big deal, but, but for those of us who grew up in the 1960s and 70s, Dylan's voice captured the angst and energy of the time. Well, well really, it stands above time in a way, expressing a deep wisdom. You might remember that six years ago, Dylan was the surprising winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. Kind of shocked everyone that a rock star could be so honored. In its citation, the Swedish Academy credited Mr. Dylan with having created new poetic expressions within the great American song tradition. And poet Philip Larkin observed that Mr. Dylan's words were delivered in a, quote, cawing, derisive voice, unquote, that seemed to carry the weight of myth and prophecy. Over the years, many have thought Dylan functioned as a kind of latter-day prophet in language that defied time. Consider these simple lines from his song, 
blind Willie McTell. Well, God is in his heaven, and we all want what's his. But power and greed and corruptible seed seem to be all that there is. That has near biblical ring to it, as do these verses of the times they are a changing. Come gather round people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept that it soon you'll be drenched to the bone. And if your breath to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are a changing. Come senators, congressmen, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the hall. For he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. There's the battle outside raging. It'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls. For the times, they are a-changing. The line, it is drawn. The curse, it is cast. The slowest now will later be fast, as the present now will later be past. The order is rapidly fading and the first one now will later be last, cause the times, they are a-changing. Dylan, often correlated to biblical language. For instance, in this song, you hear the great change-up Jesus describes with God's inbreaking kingdom, where the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Now, nearly 60 years later, these lines seem prescient to our current conditions, don't they? Line up that stanza concerning senators and congressmen next to the pictures of the siege of the Capitol building on January 6, 2021. Of course, Dylan follows a long line of prophetic voices. He had many prophetic forebears, one of whom we heard from today. I'm thinking Mr. Larkin's observation about Dylan could be applied to John the Baptist. His words were delivered in a cawing, derisive voice that seemed to carry the weight of myth and prophecy. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. <laughs> That's the verse on our Christmas card today that with that lovely sentiment from Cousin John, it doesn't have the same mellow timbre as the times they are changing or the sweetness of silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Even cynics and atheists find it hard to resist the sentimental Christmas story. You know, cooing baby, mother and child, friendly animals, angelic hosts singing alleluia, Warm family time, friends blending their voices in a spontaneous choral moment around a piano inspired by spiked drinks. That's what Christmas and its Advent prelude have come to mean. Well, that and shopping, of course. Over these next weeks, media will be cluttered with analysis of our collective spending patterns as though that had become the principal message from the baby Jesus. Consume your way into a better tomorrow. And for our pleasure, the story has been sanitized and prettified, made suitable for children of all ages, even us big ones who tend to like our religious traditions, sweet and smooth and easy to swallow like a satisfying rum-laced eggnog sprinkled with nutmeg. The days between Thanksgiving and New Year's have become a feel-good marketing moment of stupendous proportions and a major driver of our economy. We should all give good gifts because that will keep our nation from slipping into recession. No Christmas pageant that I've ever seen begins with a little guy dressed up like the wild desert prophet shouting out to the audience, you brood of vipers! <laughs> that would spoil the moment. So we'll talk about John now at a safe distance from December 24th, and then, if you're brave, you'll remember John's part of the story as a sort of homework assignment when you've returned to your room after overdosing on relatives, friends, booze, and rich food. At last, in your own bed, left to your own agitated thoughts, you'll have a moment to consider 
just what this season might be for you. After all, besides a headache, credit card payments, and a New Year's resolution to start another unsuccessful diet. Every year, I like to point out on this Sunday that John stands above my head in the pulpit in the mosaics of Christ Church. He's been cleaned up. You know, it wouldn't do to have a disheveled, wild-eyed nomad popping a locust into his mouth, emblazoned in sparkling mosaics amidst 34 different kinds of marble. But you can tell it's John because his left hand and index finger are held up, pointing to the figure in the dome mosaic. In Christian art, John is often depicted pointing to Jesus because that was his prophetic vocation as described in Scripture. He's the one that announces the arrival of, or points to, the Messiah. And you know, he's, in a, he's a very important link for us to the real world. And here's the interesting thing. It seems that John held real spiritual power. Otherwise, why would anyone go out into the desert to listen to his challenging message? Sort of a prophetic rock star, I'm thinking. If he, if he were around today, he could probably make a lot of money, what with his cawing, derisive voice that carried the weight of myth and prophecy, maybe paired ironically to a new electric car called Viper. As it is, it's hard enough for all of us to manage to make our way to a well-appointed, artfully constructed sanctuary in the company of mostly respectable people for about an hour listening to well-organized, civilized speech and lovely music in the center of a spectacular metropolis. Given Roman oppression, John was likely anticipating that the hoped-for Messiah would have a political agenda, but this was linked with the ethical character of the people. Could they possibly reform in time for the new thing God intended for them? This is what drove John's popularity, this insistence that God had something big in mind, and that meant the lazy status quo was no longer acceptable. His words were harsh, but his message was about hope. The times they are a-changin', he sang 2,000 years before Dylan came along. Something big was afoot, something seismic, disruptive, as we like to say now. Those who were unprepared would be swept away. That's the message the people came out to the desert to hear. And we're told all sorts of people went out. According to Luke, even corrupt tax collectors went out to listen to John. And after hearing this truth-telling, they asked, well, given all of this, what shall we do? He said to them, stop cheating. And soldiers asked, and what shall we do? And John said, don't extort or intimidate. Others asked, what shall we do, John? And he said, if you have two coats, give one to someone who has none. And if you have plenty to eat, share. God's big thing had homely ramifications for the people. They were supposed to clean up their act, get their lives in order, stop abusing one another, and put on the heart of compassion. He might have said, love God with everything you've got and love your neighbors as you love yourselves. And he might have added, God's way in the world is not for the faint-hearted, but it is the way of hope and faith and love. It's a demanding path where the chaff of your life will burn away to reveal the beautiful God nature within. This isn't a sentimental process, and you cannot buy it in the store. It comes by way of intention and decision, work and prayer, patience and the support of sisters and brothers, siblings of every sort, traveling the same path, and most importantly, it comes through God's providential grace that always holds and sustains us no matter what. These change in times require the work of love. So that's our Advent homework assignment. Consider your role, your work, your call 
Imagine John confronting your corruptions with a word of transforming grace. I tell you, this is powerful stuff you won't get anywhere else. Bloomingdale's doesn't stock this, and you won't find it in a bottle, and Amazon Prime can't deliver it to your door. But man, oh man, an awesome gift is there for the taking because at times they really are a changin'. Friends, now I invite you to join your hearts with mine in the prayer Jesus gave us to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. <laughs>